You're listening to the Atlanta Dream Center Church Podcast. If you'd like to support this ministry, log on to www.dreamcenterchurch.com, where every dollar advances the kingdom of God. We hope that this message edifies and encourages you to do the great things God has called you to do. Well, last week we talked about the contrast of God, and today I want to kind of tie this thing together. Now, listen, I've preached this before. And uh, this sermon is one of my favorite sermons. I told my wife, I probably won't preach this for another good 10 years, for all I know, unless the Lord changed my mind. But we're going to talk about sin. We're going to talk about God's redemption. We're going to talk about how good God is. You guys believe God's good in this place? Does anyone in here believe that? I, I do. But I want to talk about art before we get into all that. Thanks, dude. Look, you are a pro. Oh, my gosh. Michelangelo and Micah Palmer sound the same. Martha Stewart. No, no, you did the wrong one. Right here. Okay. You, Sorry. Oh, no. There you go. There you go. Perfect. Thank you, Micah. You want to do the other ones? Yeah, get as many as you can of, all right? But I want to talk about art. I'm going to put a picture up on the screen. See, I like art a lot. Art provokes these weird feelings in everybody. And the truth is, most of us don't like what art makes us feel. Does anyone, does anyone like museums? Anyone in here like museums? Man, I used to have the, you guys know the Museum of Modern Art, the MoMA? I used to have the MoMA app, and I used to just look at it randomly. Like, I just, I don't know, there's something about art that I like, but it provokes feelings. What I mean by that is this piece of art that you're looking at right here in the center. You see, this, this piece of art's called the Untitled. What it is, it's a white canvas painted with white paint. It's beautiful, huh? <laughs> What I'm about to tell you, you guys are all going to regret your life choices. You're going to all wish you went into art. This piece of art right here, untitled, sold for $20 million. $20 million. Can you believe that? Does anyone in here believe that? This is by Robert Ryman. Robert Ryman was known for minimalist art. He was very famous for it. And uh, he painted this. And you could tell how much effort and creativity it took. He went very heavy in the white paint. Micah, come here. I need your help again, man. Thanks, bro. Micah, you're, I'm going to put you to work, okay? Yeah, yeah, will you open that up? I got a few of them. You open a few of them up? Yeah, thanks, Micah. Now, this is what I'm talking about. It causes an emotion inside of you. So for some of you guys, this made some of you guys a little angry and confused. Who would buy this for $20 million? If I give you $20 million, I bet you you wouldn't go buy that piece of work. I bet you that's not what you would do. Right? That's crazy, right? I see a head shaking. People are, eyes are, jaws are dropped. I can't believe it. 20 million. Right now, I think the lottery is 20 million. That's like winning the lottery and the first thing you do, like, well, I'm going to buy that white piece of paint. <laughs> but that's what it does, right? Someone looked at that, and I know the art world is a different world, but someone looked at that and thought, oh, I'm going to spend 20 million. And it's not because it was white paint on a canvas. I'm going be honest. You could go duplicate this same piece of art and then want it sell for $3. I'm just going to tell you that right now. It's actually not the art itself. Truthfully, it's because of Ryman, the, the artist. The guy who created it is the one who makes the art valuable. And I love that. And I love that. There's other pieces of art. I don't know. Sometimes I look at things. You got anyone in here like, ab I love abstract art. I like looking at it and glaring at it and pretending I'm knowing what I'm doing, you know, and saying like, oh, I like the, the aura. <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just making stuff up, right? You got one of those open? Oh, you do. You're ahead of the game. Thanks, Micah. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Micah, I'm going to just be bossing you around. <laughs> that's new. <laughs> you okay, man? <laughs> you want to air some grievances while you're up here? I like art, and I believe that God is an artist. I really do believe that. How many of you guys have ever gone outside and looked around and thought, this is incredible? Anyone ever done that? Man, I, I love it. I, I love going out. Brayton, where, where's your favorite place, Brayton? I see you back there. How you doing, buddy? Where's your favorite place to go, man, to look at nature? Where, where do you go? Yeah, he doesn't like nature. He's a liar. I saw him agree that he liked nature, and now he's over there. Piedmont Park. The one with all the man-made buildings inside of it. Yeah, I love looking at God's creation. <laughs> yeah. Have you guys ever been to the Grand Canyon? Anyone ever been to the Grand Canyon? Oh, man, it's unreal. You walk in there. My God, I'm just grabbing this paint back here. You want to help me grab some paint? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of them need to be opened up, man. You see how prepared I was this morning? Isn't that great? Shut up, Sylvia. 
I love God's creation. I love his artwork. It really is actually fascinating. Solomon would talk about it in the scriptures. He talks about the ants, the birds, the trees. He just looks like, he goes, man, look at how wise God is. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but God wasn't just a beautiful artist. He was like an engineer. Any engineers in the building today? Have you guys ever thought about trees and how crazy that is? I know, I know it sounds like I'm like smoking pot and I'm talking to you right now, but seriously, think about this for a second. Trees, they start as a seedling, right? And they grow and it's, it's almost like they grow the same thing on both ways. They send their roots, all these branches go down into the ground and they root themselves so they could go really high up in the air. And the same type of thing, these sticks that grow into the ground also grow on the top. But on the top, instead of having little hairs like roots do to suck up water, the top has these green leaves that interact with the sun and they become these beautiful giant things I don't know what they, like it's weird honestly if you look at it, if you just think like what if it was my first time coming to the world I'm an alien and I saw a tree like that would be mesmerizing and they're beautiful have you guys ever just seen a beautiful tree and you just go wow look at that tree is this too artsy for some of y'all some of y'all are like oh, trees are trees man <laughs> grow up dude are you weirdo <laughs> <laughs> I believe God's an artist. I'm going to read a scripture in Romans, and I'm going to start painting. Are you guys cool with that? Yeah? I want to make this clear. I'm not an artist. Are you guys cool with that? Yeah. Okay. It's Romans chapter 5, if you have your Bibles. Because I believe God created us to be something beautiful, and I believe something happened. Because I think a lot of us in here don't realize how beautiful God has made us or how beautiful God can make us because we've screwed up. How many of you guys have screwed up pretty bad? Anyone in here? You know, last week what I talked about, when I talked about how bad we screwed up or how many of the sins, you might not have had those sins in your mind, but I had a lot of people come to me and say, you know, I wasn't dealing with the perversion. I wasn't dealing with this, but I was dealing with this sin. I was dealing with this sin. And I realized if, uh, if I could go anywhere and not, if I could go to a place where I could never get caught for what I did and I could do anything I want and there were zero consequences, I knew exactly what I was going to do and it wasn't going to worship God. It wasn't going to go read my Bible. I had something wicked inside of me that wanted to come out. And I wasn't just one or two. It was like 10 people told me this. And I know God created us to be beautiful and wonderful, but I think a lot of us messed it up. And when I read Romans chapter five, I want to show you what it says right here. I love this verse 12. We have the New King James Version. It says this, and honestly, this entire sermon is going to be basically based out of Romans. It says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world. We're talking about Adam. And death through sin. And thus, death spread to all men because all sinned. How many guys can confess? You've sinned. Anyone in here sinned before? How many hasn't sinned? I saw, I saw hands going up. What the heck was that, man? <laughs> Got to pay attention a little better. 5.13 says this, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgressions of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. Can you guys say amen to that? For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. It's talking about Jesus for if by the one man's offense, Adam's offense, Adam's sin, his one offense, death reigned, Adam screwed things up. This one goes over there, man. Uh -oh. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you thought you were done. Much more, those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in the life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as the one man's offense, Adam's offense, judgment, we all got judged because Adam sinned. And because Adam sinned, now we're all being judged, came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, the one man's righteous act, Jesus' righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification for life. For as by one man's disobedience, one man, Adam, but many were made into sinners. So also, though, by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Come on now. Moreover, the law entered that offense 
I'm sorry, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You might be asking, Tom, what's this have to do with art? What the heck are you talking about? Well, I'm going to tell you. You see, Adam was created in the Garden of Eden. He was given dominion over everything. Honestly, he was a perfect canvas with God. He could have been anything in the world. He could have done anything in the world. He was out there. There's only one thing he was told not to do. Him and Eve, they said, hey, don't eat of that fruit, right? And we know the story. And what I just read into you is that Adam, if I could make this canvas, Adam's life, right? There's, there's some dirt and scrapes. I, I threw this in the van with a piece of wood. I don't know how to take care of canvas. And it says that Adam had sin in his life. It entered in. But what we just read said that sin was there and it reigned in him, but nobody could see it. Nobody could see the sin that was in Adam's life. It reigned, it had control of him, but there was no way to measure it. And then it says this in that scripture we just read, but until the law came, sin then was imputed. And this is what it means. Now, as soon as God said, do not commit adultery, man Sin was exposed. In fact, if I was to say that scripture a little bit better for you, to give you a little bit more understanding, it says that when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, there was no law. God didn't have the Ten Commandments yet. And so from Adam all the way to Moses, there was this thing that was inside of us, and it's inside of you today if you don't know Christ. It's inside of us, and what it is, is it reigns, it rules. And what it means to reign is it means has, it has dictatorship over you. It's your master. It's what controls you. You run after your selfish desires because of this thing inside of you. You don't have control. You think you have control, but you find yourself late at night abandoning all your control to whatever that thing is calling you. And it says when Moses showed up and he gave the Ten Commandments, you guys know the story. This is a crazy story, right? He gives the Ten Commandments. The law comes into play. And God gives us the law. Why does he give us the law? Hey, Mike, pick up a paintbrush. You want to paint with me? Yeah, yeah that'd be fun, huh? Yeah, yeah, come on, man. Yeah, because this is, yeah, what you're doing is no fun. It says that as soon as he got the law, sin was now imputed. In other words, you could see it. This is one of the commandments that was on the Ten Commandments. Do not put any God. Hey, help me with this one right here, man. Yeah. It said, do not put any God before me. As God's writing down the commandment, as the law is coming into order, guess what the first thing the people of Israel do? They were walking with God. They are having a good time with God. God's opened up the Red Sea. Yeah, just throw some paint on there, man. Yeah, just have fun, buddy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get yourself a little brother. If you don't got one, tell your parents you want a little brother. <laughs> oh! I will buy you a new shirt. Is that your shirt? Yeah. I'll buy you a new shirt. Yeah, I don't know if you guys, you guys should take a lesson on that. She, he looked directly at his wife and said, I'm so sorry. There you, go. you got me, brother? There you go. You got a shirt underneath that? Huh? You got a shirt underneath that? No. no. I'm okay, right? <laughs> it's, it's on your shirt. Yeah, it's on your shirt pretty good. Yeah. It's the same. The sins of Moses and the people are upon you. <laughs> Everyone's going to just be distracted now by the sins of you, Micah. As soon as they got the Ten Commandments, man, they come down from the mountain because they hear this, and they're just everybody. Can I just say everybody's down there? And you know what they're doing? This is crazy. This is it's 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 actually it, it's stupid sounding. They walk with God all this time, and as soon as God's writing down, this is the law. This is what you should not do. This is what they do. You know what? I think Moses died up there. We should make a new God. They just saw God do all these miracles. 
They saw God do all these wonderful things. And as soon as the commandment's being written, they're down at the bottom of the mountain and they go, you know, I know we saw that stuff happen, but I feel like we should do something. Why don't we melt down all of our gold and make it look like a cow? <laughs> this is real, a calf. And they took it and they formed it into a calf and they put it up high. And as God's writing down the law with Moses, they are immediately breaking the law. Sin is being exposed. And what could have been amazing and pure it looks like a third grade. No offense if you have a third grader, but it looks like. Tri- no, you're fine. You did great. <laughs> but it doesn't stop there. They don't just, you know, you keep painting, Michael. Let's cover this thing all the way up. They doesn't just stop there. They didn't just get their sin exposed. Those guys continued to fall into sin over and over and over again. They start complaining. They they start dishonoring. And all of a sudden, when the law comes in, they're a mess. And this is what's crazy, is God purposed them not to be a mess. But it was just it was it was just nuts. He says, "Don't do this." And immediately, there's a thing inside of them. We call it sin. Sin's not the thing that you do. Like you know, it's not when you look at something bad. It's the thing inside of you that causes you to, you to look at something bad. And the law comes through, and what does it do? It exposes the sin that was reigning in their life. And what could have been a pure and a holy canvas becomes useless. I mean, some of you, you know, I was talking about art, and it is kind of cool looking, let's be real. It's just a piece of garbage. Mike, I'm going to have you continue that one because I'm going to move down here, okay? And hey, I want you to cover that thing all the way through. So I want, yeah, I want to see how dark our sin really gets. In fact, Mike, I'm going to spray some black paint on there that help you out, okay? Yeah, is that cool? Yeah. yeah. How are you doing? Okay. <laughs> there you go, buddy. There you go. Because I got another guy, David. Man, David. <laughs> David was purposed to be the prophesied king. It was going to be him. He was anointed. You know, when you read his story, he's just this nice guy, taking care of the sheep, strong, courageous, the ideal man, ladies. Except he wasn't. He screwed up real bad. He sees a woman taking a bath on the roof while he's at home. His army's at war. All of his men are at war. And he's at home, and he sees a girl, and it says this in scriptures, if you lust with the eye, you're committing adultery. And he looks at that girl and sees how beautiful she is, and he lusts for her. And that's what he does. He doesn't just lust. He says, I want her to come to my house, bring her over here. He screws up. This is what's crazy, though, is he thinks, you know, how many guys think we're so smart sometimes, right? Sometimes we think, oh, I'm smart. I won't get in trouble for this. He sends her home. One and done, and he then finds out that she's pregnant. So quickly, he's trying to figure out, how can I cover the sin up? How can I, I need, to, I need to do something here. So he starts calling up the general, and he brings back her husband, a Hittite man. A man who was an outcast who found solitude with David. He found purpose with David. And David, because he's trying to cover up the mess he's made, he starts trying to cover up. He says, hey, I want you to go home, and I want you to go home to your wife. I want to bring you back from war. I want you to go and be with your wife. So he starts covering up his sin, right? But it doesn't seem to really work because this guy is so pure and so holy, he won't go home to his wife. He says, we're in the middle of war. And as he's trying to cover it up, it's like it won't work. It just seems to get worse. It says the Hittite, instead of going home to his wife to be with her and sleep with her and so he could cover up his sin, he lays at the door of the king. He said, how can I go home when the rest of my men are out at war? So David, knowing you can't cover it up by that, you know what he does? Oh, man, you know what he does? It's it's crazy because I look at David and go, man, David, you made a mess, but he doesn't know how messy it is. He sends a message yeah, you want to do another one? Hey, you know what you want to do? Can you do me a favor, bro? I want you to do the other big one. Can I give you that honor? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can put that on the ground, man. Just watch your feet. Watch your shirt. 
Oh, no. There we go. Just right here, right here, right here on the floor. So he says, okay, I can't cover it up by making it look like you got her pregnant. You know, there's no drug test back then. There's no DNA test. So he does, a, he does this idea. He says, oh, you know what? I want you to go back to war, my man. Sends him back to war, and he says, well, I want you to take this letter to your commanding officer. So he gives him a letter, and the letter says this. Take this man, this Hittite. I want you to put him in the front lines, the strongest part of the army against us. I want him dead. Because I messed up pretty bad. And I've been trying to cover it up, but it's not working. So I'm going to send him out there. And if he dies, well, then I don't have to worry about what people think. How many of you guys have noticed most of the time, sin is only like it hurts your pride when you get caught. You know, in secret, it's kind of, you know, you, you kind of feel it. But when you get caught. And David did everything he could not to get caught. So he sends that Hittite out. That Hittite's out there in war. And guess what happens? David gets a message. Your cover-up worked. It worked pretty good. He's dead. He's gone. <laughs> David probably slept pretty good that night, knowing his sin was covered, knowing that he could take Bathsheba. It says as soon as he gets the message, that right after that, he calls her in and marries her after she's done mourning, makes her his wife. She's pregnant. I'm sure no one was counting the months. It's the king. No one's going to find out anything. Bathsheba has the baby. David had a nice covered painting. You couldn't really tell what was the sin anymore. And like many of us, when we sin, something that happened with David is that over time, he thought it wasn't there anymore. He thought time healed him. <laughs> He thought, oh, that was such a long time ago. I'm, I'm fine. Until one day, a prophet shows up and tells him this wacko story. And David hears the story, and he thinks it's real. And he says, hey, you know what? Uh, that guy in that story who took someone else's sheep, he should die. And the prophet says to him, that man is you, David. I see your sin. David the king. This is the guy, by the way, just a few chapters earlier, saw the presence of God come into his camp, right? And he dances around. I mean, he's dancing. He's this crazy, wild guy. He's in love with God. And he made such a mess in his life. This is actually a really cool thing. He never danced again after Bathsheba. He was a mess. In fact, for the rest of his life, he had a struggle with his family, with his sons, with his daughters. People were killing each other in his family. His entire family was ruined. Oh, David, why did you have to screw up? That's what's really sad about David. You and I know his sin. I mean, how many of us in here are so happy that people don't know our sins, but we know David's sin? God used it as an example for us. You still doing that big one over there? David. Got another guy for you. Peter. <laughs> I love Peter. New Testament Peter. Peter's this dude. Sits with Jesus every day. <laughs> he hangs with him for years, man. Years. Hanging out with Jesus. I, I don't know, man. That sounds like a dream come true, doesn't it? He's learning. He's, he's being taught. And this is a cool thing about Jesus. Jesus knows exactly how Peter is. He knows him, but Jesus likes hanging with him anyways. And Jesus says this one sermon one time. He says, man, don't ever deny me. He says, if you're ashamed of me and you deny me, I'll deny you to my father. You know what he's saying? He's saying, if you can't, you can't proclaim who I am, then I won't proclaim you when you stand before my father in judgment. I'll look at him and go, I don't, I don't know that person. I deny that person. I don't know who that is. Peter hears that sermon. He knows this sermon. And this is what's nuts. 
as Peter's walking with Jesus every day. Now, listen, I, I'm sure Peter had some messes in his life. Thanks, Papa. Top's not done. You know, I'm going to go to this one then. I'm sure that Peter had some already messes in his life. You know, he probably lied to his sister when he was a kid or whatever, you know. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Daniel, I complimented you on this, and now I'm going to have to take it back. Let me pull this off, Dad. I can paint like this. You want to put another one on there while you're doing it? <laughs> sure, sure, Daniel. I'm going to do it right here, Papa. I'm gonna, you, want, you want to grab another one over there, Dad, and hang it out? We got another one for you over there. You see all the way down there? Peter probably had a mess, but this is where he really screwed up. He walks with Jesus every day. He's probably feeling pretty clean. But this is what he does. Jesus is about to go to the cross. And Peter says, no, no, Lord, don't do it. You know, I don't want you to die. And Jesus looks at him and says, Peter, you don't even know how ugly you are inside. You think you're so pure and holy. You think you're going to go to the cross with me? Peter, you know how ugly you are inside? We talked about this last week. Who knows the heart? It's a deceitful thing. Oh, but Jesus, I'm going to go to the cross with you. I'm going to go with you. I'll die with you. He says, Peter, before the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny, or one time, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Not one time, Peter. You know my sermon. You were there when I spoke this. Sure enough, while Jesus is in the lowest point of his life, the mess of Peter gets exposed. His sin, his nastiness, his, his ugh, the thing that none of us want to talk about what's inside of us. He's afraid, he's fearful, he's watching his master die, get beat, get flogged. Watch your feet. He says, no, 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 I don't know who that is. He goes by a little girl who's at the gate. You just read this if you're on the Bible plan with us. He says, aren't you one of the disciples? Haven't I seen you with that Jesus, the one they're about to crucify, the one that they're, they're putting into trial right now? Aren't you that one? Not me. <laughs> you got the wrong guy, sister. It's crazy. Same story. Just like we talked about with David. Didn't even see his sin yet. Gets asked again, hey, aren't you? Didn't I see you and Jesus kicking back earlier? I saw you guys in your hats, you know, and you guys wore the same t-shirts. Jesus BFF, you know, BFF, arrow pointing to each other. No, 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 that's not, that's not me. You got the wrong guy. Two times. Two times he denies him. At this point, I, I don't imagine he's saying to himself, I remember when God told me, if I deny him, then he'll deny me. I don't think he's thinking that. You know what he's thinking? He's thinking, I just need to survive. And while he's doing that, his ugliness is being exposed. And this is what gets wild, guys. Can I just tell you what gets really wild? The third time he does it, this is what's crazy. In the sovereignty of God, because he's so good and kind to us, he allowed Peter to see his own wickedness, to see his own mess. Someone asked him, hey, aren't you one of the disciples? Haven't I, didn't I see, you're the guy who cut off the ear of the guy over there. And weren't you the guy? Not me. I don't, I don't know. I don't know who you're talking about. I'm the wrong guy. And as soon as he says it, he hears a rooster start crowing. And immediately he's exposed. What could have been a perfect picture is destroyed. I was supposed to be the one who went to the cross for Jesus. But now look at me. I denied him. These guys in the Bible. What about me? What about you? Last week, talking about people. Mike, can I use this one? Is it all of them? Oh, I got some little ones. I'll use a little one. It's easier to carry. I've only lived 33 years, so I got a smaller one because I'm going to grow. I'm going to get a bigger one. 
Born 1988, June 23rd, the best day of my parents' life, they said. <laughs> I came out of the womb, I was walking on water, I was telling parables. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that might be blasphemy, you're right. It's a pretty good kid growing up, to tell you the truth. I don't remember much, you know, being a good kid. My parents hit me pretty hard, I forgot. I'm just kidding. I don't think I ever got spanked. I think I got spanked twice in my life, three times maybe. Yeah, I was a pretty good kid. I was just running around. You probably wouldn't know this. I was really shy. Didn't like talking to people. I would cry. I mean, even when I was 18 years old, my dad would tell people I was a youth pastor. I'd go, don't tell people that. I'm not worthy. That's what I tell them. <laughs> Seriously, you remember that? I'd argue with you. Don't tell them I'm a youth pastor. My dad probably thought I was a psychopath. <laughs> you did you? <ya>? Yeah. <laughs> Now, I had sins, but I was pretty, pretty good about confessing. I remember one time I was rhyming, you know. My, my, we, this is before you could check up ratings on movies and actually know. I don't know if you guys remember this, but the 90s PG movies could be rated R. Do you guys remember that? Like, it was, it was, you were guessing. You never knew, you know. It's like, hey, this looks like a good family film. And then it's like, oh, this is not a family film. And so I, I, I learned some cuss words. My dad would always turn off the TV anytime there was a cuss word. Two cuss words, usually. you say, one more time of saying that, we're turning you off. That's why you always got the TV. Did anyone have a parent like that? Yeah, yeah. He'd always say that every time someone would cuss. One more time. Mwah, mwah. And it was like a good 30 minutes before the next cuss word. Oh, okay. I'll give him one more chance. He was just talking on the TV. <laughs> and you would turn off movies. And, but that was probably, we lived in, out in the country. We lived way out in Ruth, California. Way out there, man. You guys would never go there. And uh, so I learned, I remember this as a kid, I... I knew what cuss words were, and I remember rhyming with my sister Hannah. We're on the back deck. Hannah, you, do you remember this at all? I felt so miserable. I rhymed with hit. You guys know what word I'm going for here. And I said the S-H word. Oh, convicted. I ran inside. I cried. I said, Mom, I cussed. <laughs> That's a pretty good kid. I hope my kids are like that. But as I got older, there's some secrets that started growing in my life. I remember when lust started building up. Hey, Mike, I, I, think, I think we're good. You can stop right there. I want to leave some room. Yeah, uh, right here for the paint. Let's make sure we have enough paint on all these things. I'm not a real artist. So we're going to give. I remember uh, just little things. I don't want to get too into this. I just remember lust coming into my life. I'm like 13 years old. I'm watching my eyes wander, and I remember, you know, because I prayed, and I was, a, I was a Christian kid, but I remember getting a sin on me. And trying to hide it, I didn't want anyone to know. I remember thinking to myself, I'm so miserable. I remember praying to God, God, will you ever use me? I've screwed up. I'm a young man. I'm screwed up. I didn't know the scripture about the fear of the Lord keeps a young man pure. I didn't know that stuff. I, I didn't know anything. I, I just knew what was I was taught from my siblings and what I was taught from my friends and what I was taught at church. And then when I got older, lust got crazier, lying became a thing. Before I knew I had this mess, but this is where, I, I don't think I even realized how big of a mess I had because the truth was, this is what everybody looked like. So I didn't feel that bad. And this is crazy. It wasn't until I was 29 years old, four years ago, and the truth is, it was maybe the best thing that could have ever happened to me. It changed my life. I saw how gross I was. And what I'm about to talk about in this room has damaged some of your families massively. Some of you have done the same thing and never told your spouse. I know this because I've had people come and tell me. At 28 years old, 29 years old, 29 years old. I have an emotional affair. You know what an emotional affair is? Most people, when they hear that, I, even me, when I first heard about emotional affairs, I was thinking, what the heck is, what, what is an emotional affair? That doesn't make any sense. What is that? Because I saw affair as doing the deed, but the truth was I started, if you will, this is the best way I could describe it. You know, like right before you start dating someone, you're hanging out with them all the time, you're talking to them all the time. I'm doing that with a girl who's not my wife. Now remember, I'm in, 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 in my house, and I'm in bed, and I'm laying down, and the Lord's telling me, you need to tell your wife. You see, he starts exposing me to me. 
I mean, you're laying in bed saying, God, I don't want to tell my wife. That's the last person I want to tell. It says in the scriptures, confess to your brother, not your wife. <laughs> Y'all think I'm joking, though. I'm not. I was legit arguing with them. And he tells me, he shows me in a vision, you're going to tell her in the car while you're going to Arkansas. We're going to Arkansas in two days. I was undecided if I was going to go with her. I woke up the next morning. I said, Susie, it doesn't matter what I tell you. I'm going to Arkansas with you. I knew I was about to face my crimes, if you will. That two days go by, and I'm out in the car, and I'm driving. And my wife asked me about that relationship. I said, is it appropriate? And the Lord said, this is it. I feel like I didn't have a choice. So I told her, nope. Man, she beat the tar out of me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can give her a hand for that. Yeah, yeah, applaud her for that. We don't, we don't support abuse, but y'all. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure people will drive. You probably find me on World Star somewhere. I'm telling you. And I started telling her something happened to me. I'll never forget this. The Lord just said, "Keep explaining it. Or don't hide a thing." As I told her more and more, something happened to me. What I thought was just this emotional affair, I started looking at my life. I even told her, I said, I don't even know where it starts. She said, when, when did you start messing up? And as I was sitting there, I was going, I don't know, actually. Like, I don't know. It, it wasn't when, it, it couldn't have been. It, it couldn't have been when she was around. It was before that. Like, I don't even know where it starts. And the longer I sat on it, the more I saw this behavior that I had, this prideful behavior I was looking back at my life, and I was going, I don't know when it, I, I don't know. Like, it wasn't like I wasn't that guy and became that guy. I started to realize something. My mess was there the whole time. It wasn't, oh, I screwed up this one time. I made a mistake. I, I want to say this to any man who gets into an affair, an emotional affair. It's not a mistake. You got a character flaw. You have an issue. It's called sin. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm realizing, oh, I am in darkness. And every time I confess to her more and more, anything I had going on, oh, I deleted this text, and I did this, or I did this, and I just started telling everything I could remember. All of a sudden, it was just a little blot of my purity that I saw pure. All of a sudden, I realized, I looked back and go, wait a minute, I am dark. I am sick. I am wicked. It changed everything for me. I started looking at how I treated you guys. I looked at how I behaved on this stage. Wait a minute, I'm wicked up here. Oh, it's so easy for my pride to get involved up here. I, I preach. Well, that's just little old me. There's a million and a half more sins in there. But statistically, I've told you this, I'm going to tell you it again. You guys in this room have made a mess of what God had purposed for you. Can I tell you some stats? Out of 100 people in this room, there's at least 27 people, men and women, looking at pornography on a regular basis. Do you know there's more than 40% of you? This is tough. I want to say this. I'm not condemning you. I just want to air it out. There's been affairs in this room. There's been such great hatred that you will never talk to that person again in this room. There's been such great lies. To this day, you're still faking it. Some of you guys have made decisions in your life that you wish you could go back and reverse. There's been more regret in this room. And the truth is, I, I know for a lot of us, I look at this, and I know I was looking at my life. When I was in my lowest point. I was sitting right here in the front. My wife made me sit up front in church that Sunday after I told her. It was actually off the chain. It was the best. I remember sitting here going, God, how can you use me? I just had this image in my head, and one day I'll show you guys this movie. You guys ever seen the movie Warrior? You guys ever seen that movie? No? It's a great movie. One of the main characters' name is Tommy. That's why I like it so much. I'm a narcissist. It was a wrestling match. And I had this image of this guy who was in this movie wrestling his brother. And in the end of the movie, if you haven't seen it, I'm about to ruin it for you. At the end of the movie, they're, they're fighting. He's choking out his brother. It's UFC. He keeps telling his brother, just tap out, Tommy. It's okay. Just tap out. That's what he kept saying. 
until finally his brother taps out. Super emotional. I cry every time I see that movie. You too? I, it's one of my favorite movies, Warrior. Go check it out. I ruined it for you, so sorry. I was sitting up here going, God, my life's ruined. How are you ever going to use me? He just kept saying to me, tap out, Tommy. Stop trying to cover up your sin. Just give it to me. And I want to give an opportunity because, look, I told you some stories. You know, Micah was painting his own story. His was a lot bigger than mine, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Pastor of the Spanish church. I told you about David. I showed you Adam. But I don't want to continue this sermon without having your art, your mess up here. So I want to give you an opportunity. I'm going to tell you, watch your step. But I got three canvases up here. One small on this side. I got two more over here. But if you've ever screwed up in your life, you got some sins It'd be actually even great of you if you could say, you know, I messed up. It was a long time ago. And, and, and don't worry, if God's forgiven you, you can still put it up there. It's okay because there's something beautiful. But I would, come on up here. I got plenty of paintbrushes and plenty of paint. I want you to go ahead and mark. You can do as big or as small as you want. I just need you to watch your feet, okay? Watch your feet. Wait, are we sharing? Yeah, grab, grab, grab a paint and, and hit, a, hit a canvas. Just wherever you can. You could paint over someone else's paint. Yeah, that's perfect. Come on, get your own artwork up there. Yeah, uh, 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 thanks. Oh, right, splates. Yeah, I got another paintbrush right here. You could hit any paint. Yeah, you could hit one that's already been painted on. Yeah, you could paint one. Yeah, go ahead. I don't want to go any further without you being able to have a chance to say, you know what, I've screwed up. I want to see my artwork. Because we're going to talk about God's great masterpiece. You need a bigger canvas. <laughs> Watch your step. It's okay if we... <laughs> It's okay if we mess up the church, y'all. This is about Jesus. We got little canvases. We got big canvases. We got old canvases. I'm going to tell you, don't let someone else do it for you. You do it. Come on. Don't, don't pretend you don't got something big in your life. Some of you guys got big things. If my mom's up here, come on, then you know you got to be up here too. I don't think this woman's ever sinned in her life. <laughs> Come on, I want this canvas filled. This next part, when you guys are feeling that, I want to do something, Micah. You gotta help me with this part too, okay? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy you a whole new wardrobe because I, I ruined your shirt. And I owe you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you here in a second. Who said that? White? I don't think I have any white paint. Go ahead. I want these things covered. Don't, don't leave any space for me, okay? You want Matt Gray and Russell, you guys want to do me a favor? I love church that we could all be together. This is fun, huh? We just, whatever we want to do, we could just do it. There's no rules to this, huh? I got these two pieces of plywood. Can you guys help me out really quick? Can you help me out, Russ? I would do it, but um, I'm lazy. We should grab this one and this one. This one right here. And what we're going to do, we're going to take it up. You see that drum cage? We're going to put it up on that drum cage. We're going to set them side by side, okay? Thanks, Brock. Mike, I'm going to have you do it. I'm going to have you hold this for me for a second. Thank you, Josh. Hold this microphone. I want you to hold it for me. You see, what happens is when we screw up pretty bad, we get this. We get this. It just looks nasty. It's just a gross-looking picture. Some of you have got worse-looking pictures than this in your life. Oh, we're going to put it up on the drum machine. Stay here. We're going to stand up tall. And this is what people tell us to do when we came to Christ to say, you know, ask him for forgiveness and he'll forgive you. So we do. And this is what happens. It says that he 
comes and he takes our sins away. You, you mind if I'm going to come down here, okay? I don't want to get on you. Yeah, too late. We say, hey, go to Jesus, and he'll forgive you. He'll, he'll make you new. And this is what forgiveness feels like and looks like to me. Like, I, 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 I got some of the weight taken off me, but I don't know if you guys have ever felt this before, but I remember when I was coming out of that emotional affair, I remember feeling real dirty. And when I went for forgiveness, I didn't see my sins disappear. He goes, you know, he tells us, he says, man, I, I separate your sins as far as from the east as from the west. And when I screwed up, I kept looking at it going, I, I, don't, I still see my sin. And in fact, if you were to think about your own sin right now, you still remember it. That's why you came up here. This is what happens when we say, God, forgive me of my sins, forgive me of my sins. And as we start scraping down, we, we see it just slightly different, you know. But the reality of it is I still feel the pain of my sin. And I remember well, afterwards I was going, God, you said to me that you separate as far as from the east as from the west. You don't see my sin anymore. But why the heck do I still see my sin I mean, I can scrape this thing for days. It's not going anywhere. It just looks worse. You want, you want to scrape some pictures for me? Thanks. Yeah, I know you'd love to. Mike, you're the best brother I've ever had. Sorry, everybody else. And I know I'm not alone in this. I know that you've asked God to forgive you of your sins, but some of you guys are still being tormented at night for the things that you thought and said. I know last week when I was preaching about the wickedness of man, some of us were coming out of that thing going, man, I, I don't want to actually think about that. I've let time take care of that thing for me. And I've gone to God and I've asked for forgiveness, but uh, the truth is I don't really feel that forgiven. For some of you guys, that stuff was only a year ago. Some of the sin was just a year ago, and you're looking at it going, man, I, I still feel it. That still looks just as ugly, God. I don't see what you mean. And he looks at you and says, but I don't see it. You see, when I was uh, 15 years old, I had a vision of doing this sermon. 15 years old, I had a vision of doing this sermon. You keep scraping. No, go ahead. Hey, hit this big one right here. Yeah, yeah, you're good. Hey, you're fine. I know. You guys get nervous, aren't you? Let's sit right there. This is good. And I remember I, I was in my house. And I was praying right after the emotional affair thing. And I had taken a leave of absence from work. They asked me, the board uh, told me to work on my marriage. And they told me to take a month off. And every day I'd come in here. Every Sunday I'd come in here. And at home I'd just stay at home. And I was praying. And it was at the end of that. I said, God, I... I don't know how to preach that sermon you give me a vision of. It doesn't seem possible. So I asked him, I said, God, what, how do you want me to do this? And I was, I was in, a, in my basement downstairs. I was in a little workshop. I was in this workshop. And while I was down there, the, I was just praying, saying, God, how do you want me to do this? I, I don't know how to do this. I don't know. I'm not an artist. I, guys, seriously, the most art I've ever done in my life was in, uh, like, kindergarten. And then I also learned how, you guys know how to do that S? Does anyone in here know how to do that S? You guys know what I'm talking about? The five point? Yeah. And I knew in my heart, I was looking at this going, God, I, I know that you want people to see something. You want to see that their sin is removed from them even though they don't feel like it is. I know that's what you want. But I don't know how to do it. And so I'm at home and I'm looking it up online. How do, I, how do I make a picture out of art when it's really just a mess? How do I do that? That's what I'm asking. I'm looking all over Google and I'm looking for solutions. I didn't find anything. I seriously looked everywhere. Answers.com. Ask Jeeves. Anyone remember Ask Jeeves? <laughs> These need to be scraped. There you go, brother. Yeah.
Thanks, man. And as I was getting ready, it was the day before. I was in my basement, and I just had this thought. Well, maybe, maybe I could add something to the picture that would change. Hang on, I gotta put this microphone down. Hang on. So while I was in prayer, I found out. You add some Vaseline and you can make any image you want. And when you scrape it, something cool happens. The, the oil from the Vaseline, thank you, sir, removes the paint. So I tried it. And downstairs in my basement, Hey, I got to count really quick, guys. I got one, two, one, four, five, six, yeah. If you go downstairs in my basement right now, I have a, this is going to be tough. It's a little bit off size there. I have this same image in my basement. <laughs> a filthy mess. Some of y'all might be catching where I'm going here, but in my basement, I just have this smudge of paint and the letter T for Tom. <laughs> Seriously. You can put it right there. You're good. Want to get this one for me, too? Yeah, go ahead and scrape it. Yeah, scrape it. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, you guys are great. Yeah, I, know, I know you guys are nervous. We got one more painting over there, too. I'm going to bring it to you. How are you guys doing? You guys okay out there? Oh, this has been scraped good. So, the question needs to be asked. If God removes my sins, and here I am, a new believer, and I love Jesus, right? I'm over here going, God, I, I want to worship you. I want to follow you. I need you. But I still feel my sins. I still feel the, this, this disease inside of me. How can you tell me you're going to use me? Because I don't feel like I could be used. And I don't know if you've ever been in that position, but maybe you have. Maybe you're in this room, you're going, you know what, Tom, Pastor Tom, I've been in the position where I don't think God's going to use me anymore because I screwed up too bad before. I got people in this church right now who said, man, I, I know God called me to be a minister of the Lord. God has called me to be a pastor, but I can't. I can't do it now because I've screwed up so bad. I mean, when I was, when I was, and these are real stories, by the way. When I was a kid, I, not me, but when I was a kid, my dad used to drink and abuse me, and I grew up, and I became an abusive man, and now I'm too old to go back and go what God called me to do. His purpose for me screwed up. I, I'm missing it now, Pastor Tom. I've sinned so much that I, I made a mess of my life. That's going to work. You just trust me, okay? I've made such a mess of my life, Pastor Tom. And I know you said God forgives me. I know you say, but look at my mess. It's ugly. And I know you say you forgive me, but I still see how much I screwed up. And this is what's cool about God. God keeps looking at you going, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see your mistakes. That, did that get scraped? Thank you. I see you when you had that abortion. Statistically, you're in this room. And I need to say this to you. I'm sorry that you did that for your sake. I'm sorry because I know there's a feeling that you get. I know you don't, you're not proud of that. I know you're in here who's had an affair. There's an affair on here, you know? Some of you guys screwed up so much you don't think you'll ever get married. You're looking at yourself going, I, I can't, I'm, never, I'm not redeemable. There's no, there's no way I've screwed up too much. God wouldn't use this. I know people who truly believe that they've been cursed by God and that they won't be able to have children anymore because of the decisions they made when they were kids. They say, no, I can't walk out my purpose, God. I can't. 
I'm not worthy of your purposes, God. Look at the mess I made. But this one's crazy because I keep telling you this. Pastor Paul, all of us keep telling you, no, no, God wants to use you, but you keep trying to tell yourself, how can God use this? This is garbage. And we try to tell you, no, no, it's not garbage. God doesn't see garbage. You go, no, how is God not see garbage? Look at my paint strokes. Look at what I did. I was so lost in the world before I came to Jesus. Some of y'all are still lost. I mean, I haven't even come to Christ yet. Pastor Tommy, you don't know. Like, your worst sin was the emotional affair. Like, big whoop, buddy. What I did was so bad that if anyone in this church found out about it, I would, I'd probably be cast out. You know what's crazy about this right here? You know what's crazy about this? There's people in here who painted on here. And I'm just talking about stats here. I'm not even talking about personal. Who screwed up so bad that they lost their families. The families will never talk to them again. Addictions. How is God going to use a drug addict? Drug addict like me. You can't. Look how dark my life is. I was in the dumps, man. I was, I was out there scamming anyone. I, I know murders. Wow. Micah, you want to do me a quick favor, pal? Just scrape that one more time for me. I can't tell. I can't. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. I'm glad that I'm not God. Because look at all the nastiness in this place. I don't think I would use any of us. <laughs> but see, this is the beautiful thing about God. Last week, we talked about how bad our contrast is. We're ugly. We're messy. We're disgusting. We talked about child pornography. Did you know, statistically, that's in this room? Did you know that? That's crazy. Did you know abuse is in this room? Can I talk about some other things that disqualified us? Thanks, Micah. Confusion and perversion. God can't use me. He doesn't even like me. How could he? Micah, you want to do me a favor? Do you know how to place that in there? It's a little short, but what we're going to do is like here. Thanks, pal. But you see, when Jesus looks at you and you say, God, how can you forgive my mess? He says, I don't want to see your mess. Micah, will you hold that for me, actually, buddy? Because I, I don't think those tax are a little too low. You're going to go to the side, Micah. Actually, Micah, let me get low. Can you get low for me, Micah, right here? Did you get it? My gosh, you are an artist. Oh, so close. Get right here. Right here. Come here. Well, at the bottom, just like that. He says, you see, when I see your sin and when I say I forgive you and I scrape off that mess off of you, he says, I know all you could see is your past and your darkness, but all I see is what I did, which is redeem you through my son, Jesus. And we got this disfigured picture of a cross. How cliche of a piece of artwork is this? No, 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 for real, though, because when I first did this, I wrote that T in my, in my, my basement, I wrote that T. And once I figured out how to do it, I thought, man, wouldn't it be so cool, you know, if I could get a picture of Jesus' face, you know? I did, I really did. I sat in here for hours and hours and hours. Guys, I was, I'm not an artist. I'm drawing these eyeballs, trying to make it realistic. I'm like, it has to look good. And then I'm looking at that picture of, you know, the Jesus' face and the toast, you know, thinking maybe I could do that. Because if I'm real honest with you, the cross, <laughs> hey.
The cross has become so cliche in the church. It's so cliche, legitimately. And I was making this, I was saying, God, I don't want people, you know, I don't want to see sins get removed. And you say you forgive us, we don't feel it, but it's because we don't see it the way you see it. We see our past, but you see our redemption, right? I was like, not a cross. Can't we do a picture of you instead? Can we do a picture of like the Holy Bible or something cool, you know? Coming off the clouds, you know, it'd be cool if it was like super detailed. And that night I was driving home. When I first got this set up, I was driving home and I was thinking, God, I don't want to do a cross. It's lame. And he corrected me. He says, it's because you don't know what the cross represents. I said, well, I know what the cross represents. You died on the cross. He said, no, you don't get it. No joke. This is crazy. I'm at home. That night, I'm up all night, just like I was last night, stress sleeping. You guys know what stress sleeping is? You start dreaming about what you're about to do, and it freaks you out. I literally had a dream last night that the whole place was being renovated when we came in this morning. I was like, what's happening? And I wake up the next morning early. It's 5.30 in the morning. And I'm looking at different art, and I come across this picture by Andy Warhol. It's called The Big Chair. I'm going to show him that picture, can we, Madison? And this image is in New York City. It's an electric chair. And this electric chair was taken, I think it's, I believe this is 1965. It might be 63. Andy Warhol, in his classic way, he would screen print the same image in different colors. Pop out color, bright pink, blue. And he drew this picture of an electric chair, empty, sitting. And what's cool is, is he took this picture after the last two executions ever to happen in New York City. And the statement was clear. This piece of art right here was to celebrate that the death sentence was no longer a thing. And how do you celebrate that death sentence is no longer a thing? You take a picture of the same device that put people to death over and over and over again, and you show it empty. Never again will someone sit here. When I looked at this, I was at home and I was just brought to tears. I said, God, I forgot that cliche cross that you made art out of my sin with. You, the great artist. It's a reminder what you see when you look at my sin. This is what it says in scriptures, that he sees Jesus, not me. He sees Jesus. And so we, as a collective church, we came up here and we just, oh, let's make a mess, man. Let's just tell our sin how bad it is. There's no way God could redeem this. And yet he says, you know what I see in your life? I see an empty crucifix. No longer will you pay for those sins by death. Now you are my artwork. You are the thing that my son went to that cross for, and he was the last one. And he says, and now, now the cross is your symbol. The death sentence is over. And this is where I want to land with today's sermon. We talked about how great God was two weeks ago. He's crazy wrathful. We talked about how he's got destroyed nations. He tells Israel, don't think it's because you're righteous and I'm destroying these nations. I'm destroying these nations because of how wicked they are. He does not play around. That's our God, that is the contrast that we have of our God. He is that mean, if you will. But then there's this other side that you and I are walking, and Jesus says it this way. He's declaring the year of his favor, his favor. Those same nations, how wicked they were. They saw, he saw, I'm sorry, he saw your wickedness. And he said, instead of my wrath, I want to give you my cross. I will pay the price for you. And this is where his contrast and our contrast collide. In fact, the only reason you can see this cross is it's, it's a negative. What a negative is, it's just the contrast. And your darkness is where he shines his glory the most. We're going to end this. Heavy. I'm going to have you come on up. It's a nothing piece of art. But I want to say this about you. You made those decisions. You did things you thought God will never use. He says, 
Just watch me work with it. God, I'm not capable of going any further. I don't think I'm going to be used by you. I'm not going to be used in this way. He says, let me show you how good I am with art. I created the heavens and the earth. I made dust into man. I created every animal you know. I made the atmosphere. I know the galaxies by name. I know the stars by name. He says, I don't think you know who I am. I will take your sin and I'll make it into beauty. I'll take what the enemy used for wickedness. And I'll turn it to good. I'll take your ashes. And I'll make them into beauty. I don't care how dark you are. I know how to shine a light in you. And this is the God who redeems us. So I'm looking at you because I'm looking at some people in here who might be thinking to themselves, I need that redemption. I've been hiding and covering, hiding and covering. I've been covering up with more sin. I lie, I lie, I lie, I cover, I cover, I cover. I go to forgiveness, but I don't feel like he's forgiven me. I say, oh God, forgive me. And I kind of feel good. I can feel him scraping, but I don't see what he sees in me. And because of that, you've disqualified yourself from being part of the artwork that he's created you to be. And today in this room, I, I want to I do something, if you guys don't mind. I, I'm going to do it quick because I want to take communion. What, a better, what day is better to take communion than today? If you're in this room today and you're going, man, I've screwed up. Man, I, I've messed up big time. I've been telling myself over and over. I remember when God, this is a famous one, it's some Pastor Matthew. That's what he just told me. His name's Pastor Matthew. He just came out of, pro, uh, he just went into a program down in Florida. He was in church and he told me he's, he was in drugs and his addiction. He went into a program, but before he went into the program, he said, Pastor Tommy, because I told him, God has a purpose for you. He wants to use you. He said, Pastor Tommy, will he still make me a pastor? Because he called me to do that. Matthew's 60 something years old. I said, Matthew, He's the God who turns your mess into something beautiful. He will use your life. Matthew's in a program today, but no one calls him Matthew. We all call him Pastor Matthew. Because what the enemy thought he could destroy, God said, I could redeem that. Where sin abounds much, grace abounds much more so. If you're in this room today and you're saying, Pastor Tommy, I don't think... Uh, I don't think God's going to use me, but I wanted to give him a chance. Pastor Tommy, I've made a mess in my life, and I'm ready for him to scrape out my wickedness and make me new. Pastor Tommy, I, I, I need God to forgive me of my sins. I need, a, I need him to wash me clean. I need to make, he needs to make a new image in me. I know I'll never forget what I did, but he says, I, I heard you say this, Pastor Tommy, in the Bible. He said that he throws your sin into the sea of forgetfulness. That when he looks at your painting of life, he doesn't see your sin. It's gone. He's forgotten about it. He's separated it from you as far as the east from the west. All he sees is the redemptive work of his son. And I'm in here and I need that today. If you're in here, can you do me a favor? Everyone's looking. That's okay. I want you to lift up your hand real high. Look at that. Look at those hands. Look at these hands. Look at these hands. Look at these hands. Look behind you, guys. Look around you. That's a lot of people. Can you guys me? I'm not going to make you call on stage. I'm going to make you just stand up right where you're at. I want to. I want to say something over you. Stand straight up. Go ahead. Stand straight up. Don't worry. It's fine. I might make you come on stage. I'm going to make you stand right there. There's a lot of people standing. Some of you guys have been Christians for a long time. Some of you guys know of His redemptive work, but you're going, God, I need you. To, I need you to scrape me clean because I've been trying to figure out other ways to cover up my sin. And some of you guys are for the very first time saying, I'm ready to give my life to this God who's going to make something out of nothing. I couldn't be more excited that it's happening right here in this church, amen? That's crazy. So I'm going to pray a prayer, and I'm going to pray over you, but then I'm going to have you pray with me. Is that cool? And I'm going to do a salvation prayer. I want you to know this. I know a lot of you guys are good Christians. I'm not saying that you're not. You could just say this prayer with me because some of you guys are saying, I'm going to give my life to Jesus today. So we're going to pray together. I want to ask God to scrape out that mess take my ashes and make them into something beautiful. To take my mourning and turn it into dancing. To take that nastiness in my life and turn it into something worthy of Him. So church, can we just pray this prayer together? Everyone's eyes closed. Father, thank you for this opportunity to be changed, to be cleaned, 
to be made new. Make something out of me that's worthy of you. Jesus, forgive me. Scrape me. Clean me of my past, of my sin. I believe that your son died on the cross so no one else had to. He paid my price for my wickedness. And Father, I pray for the courage to walk out my purpose. I pray for the courage to walk out the way you determined for me before I was born. Father, we love you. We praise you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We all say, amen. Give the Lord a hand. We hope you enjoyed today's sermon. Once again, if you'd like to support this ministry, log on to www.dreamcenterchurch.com where every dollar advances the kingdom of God. Until next time, be blessed and go do the great things God has called you to do.